Ryan, you were talking about a lot of this because your book is out this week on CNN. So you joined Aaron Burnett, and we have a clip of your appearance on Aaron Burnett's show on CNN last and night. And yours, that, too. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. I, they, they caught me reading your texts. I was actually reading your notes because you were reading from uh, quotes. Um, but I did joke on Twitter that I was reading Ryan's text from the CIA. Uh, here is Ryan's uh, appearance on CNN. Here is part of his exchange with journalist Ryan Grimm. Members of the squad have tweeted out from the river to the sea, but the answer, I'd allow him to say it, but I wouldn't sit there quietly. I'd point out that you are calling for, once again, the extermination of millions of Jews. As I'm sure you know, though, in Likud's platform, it says, you know, from the river to the sea, there will only be Israeli sovereignty. You know, are they suggesting genocide of all Palestinians? Of course not. Exactly. So if they're if they're not, why is the other suggesting genocide? Be- because that's what Hamas supports. We've had uh, Defense Minister uh, Gallant. We will eliminate everything. An IDF spokesperson. Our focus is on damage, not on precision. Another former Knesset member. There is one and only solution, which is to completely destroy Gaza before invading it. I mean destruction like what happened in Dresden and Hiroshima without nuclear weapons. Would you join us in condemning that as well? So I I condemn nothing that the Israeli government is doing. I I stand with the people of Israel. Talk to me about that moment. What did that say to you when you were sitting there having that exchange with him? I, I thought at least he would condemn some of the things that the Israeli government had already condemned. Like, you don't have to get in front of them. Like, for, for instance, the minister who floated the idea of nuking Gaza uh, was, was roundly, like, rebuked by other members of the Netanyahu cabinet. So it was striking to me that Cruz couldn't even go as far as members of the very far-right Netanyahu cabinet. And I was just trying to, in that interview, find some com- common moral plane because, you know, anytime you have anybody on uh, who's remotely critical of Israel, the interview starts with, you know, will you condemn what Hamas did on October 7th? Today is December 5th. We're still having news cycles organized around that question from two months ago. So then it follows that, well, let's also get on the same moral level and condemn the kind of collective punishment of Palestinians as well. And then we can talk about a way forward. But he wouldn't go there. And that was kind of, uh, once he didn't, you're like, okay, well, I've got, if you condemn nothing, then there's nothing I can tell you that's going to I mean, it really was, I I hope everyone will watch, it was a fascinating exchange. We take back all the things we said about CNN. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, I I actually think that's, it's fairly interesting to me that they they ran the, I mean, a huge chunk of the clip in that exchange. Because I I think one of the benefits of that exchange, as we talked about last week, was having some time to, A, you know, have let, let these discussions breathe mm-hmm. a little bit and and having on the other hand so point b is that you know ted Cruz sitting down with somebody who's sort of openly an ideological opponent not an uh not a lawmaker not an elected official um and you know not a hack but like somebody who's actually going to engage on the issue and I, so I, I think it's actually really heartening that people watch that and uh you know, came away with this was really sort of insightful it's a it's the advantage of a longer interview too right cable is uh, you know so for, they do it to themselves like there's no there's no federal law that says they have to keep every segment to like two and a half or or three minutes but they are you know have conditioned themselves to believe that the public you know won't won't be able to kind of keep up with anything uh with anything more than that um but if you do that then right you can't you can't kind of draw out the more the more interesting takeaways from uh, from conversations like uh, I'm gonna, I condemn absolutely nothing, and, and you know, up to and including things that even that Yahoo's cabinet uh, would condemn. And that goes to what we were talking about earlier: the, this stark difference between how this conversation unfolds, you know, here in the United States, and how it how it unfolds over uh, in the Israeli media, where because there is you know so much more kind of lust for revenge after October seventh there that the is Israeli government is, is much more open about what it's doing. They don't they don't want to sugarcoat anything that they're doing in Gaza because if they sugarcoat it, then the public will, um, and some and some of the kind of ca- the cabinet will demand. No, no, no. We we want more than that. 
And there's enormous sensitivity, uh, obviously, you know, as there is in Israel, but in the United States about anti-Semitism and about this sort of Western anti-Semitism as opposed to sort of uh, radical Islamic anti-Semitism. And so we have these standards that create sort of an impossible condition for discourse on this particular issue. And I do think it's unfortunate the extent to which people are afraid. For example, when you read what you read, as we just watched again, uh, that people feel as though they have no flexibility to kind of honestly right. reckon with uh, some you, serious points there. And you know, th- there are, we, we could have gone much longer in that interview, and I think we both wanted to. Um, but yeah, that, I, I thought that was you know, the best part of the interview, the, the most helpful part of the exchange. I, I want to also put this element on the screen from HuffPost um, because it's more reporting from your book. And uh, the book, you've, you've mentioned this before, is so timely. It turned out to be so timely because it ended up, as you were digging into kind of the evolution of the squad, so much of it is sort of revolving around APAC and around the question of Israel. So this is the headline. Top pro-Israel group offered Ocasio-Cortez $100,000 of campaign cash per new book. Ryan, you also reported this week (laughs) that the, uh, I think you said like the Murdoch empire had just Mm -hmm. utterly twisted parts of the book in an effort to make Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, and the squad in general and sort of the green agenda um, look foolish. I was really like, I mean, not I, I shouldn't say surprised, but taken aback by, I think, how egregious the um, coverage of things from your book has been. Uh, Daniel Maron's article is not among them. Uh, he, he is reporting, based on your report, uh, that APAC actually reached out to Ocasio-Cortez <laughs> with, quote, a whole lot more than an olive branch. Right, yeah. So if we've talked earlier about that, um, that 2018 interview that she did with uh, Margaret Carlson on, on the firing line is like three weeks after she won her primary. She'd been nailing every single interview. And then she gets hit with questions about Israel-Palestine. And I think, and I actually rewatched it on uh, with Hassan Piker on his on his stream yesterday. Uh, we kind of, you know, went down memory lane on that interview. And her, her answers are actually fine for the most part. The, her problem is she starts to, to visibly betray a kind of lack of confidence that she's getting these questions right. And and by the end, she just taps out and says, look, I'm not an expert on this. We didn't talk about this much at my Bronx, you know, dinner table. You know, I, I'm going to talk to more people about this. Let me, you know, let me, let me step away from this question because, you know, I'm, I'm dying inside here. So basically what you can, you can see on, on her face as she's getting asked about her use of the phrase, quote, occupation of Palestine or, or equating of you know Palestinian uh, lives being taken uh, by the IDF with you know protesters getting shot in in Puerto Rico or protesters getting shot in Ferguson Missouri like uh, Carlson seems to like really object to this this equating of Palestinian lives and American uh, and American lives because the Mid- Middle Eastern dynamics are so so different and um, and so she just kind of taps out at at the very end and so what what I report in the book is that you know, about a week later. Um, when uh, she and Bernie are in Kansas you know, campaigning for a candidate out there, her uh, Corbin Trent, her communications director, gets a call and says, "Hey, you know, uh, we saw the we saw the interview. Um, you know, I, I, I'm I'm with APAC. Uh, I've already bundled together, you know, a good hundred thousand dollars to start the conversation with AOC. We can, you know, we can help to educate her, uh, to, you know, to make sure that you know she doesn't have another, uh, you know, another face plant interview like this again. And it was a it was for her team, her and her team, a real window into kind of how Washington works. And that if you were a normal member of Congress who had just won a primary uh, and had not instantly become, you know, bizarrely and uniquely this kind of global celebrity, which comes with it, all this campaign cash, you'd be like, oh, hundred thousand I dollars. Mean, I desperately need a hundred thousand dollars. And also I need, I need talking points on this issue because, you know, I didn't run on this question. I don't want it to become a huge political liability. Uh, she was in a, a position where she, you know, could, could and did say, you know, uh, thanks, but no thanks. She, she was happy to meet with, you know, groups on all sides, but didn't, but, but didn't want to kind of get hooked in with, with a, the, this first offer of $100,000 with the, uh, the, the pledge that there was lots, you know, lots more behind it. You know, instead, you're now seeing, you know, tens of millions and potentially up to $100 million, you know, being spent against the squad in the, in the next cycle to kind of 
you know, wipe them out as a political entity. And tell us about how your book was covered um, by, I believe, oh, it was yeah. the Daily Mail and the New York Post. Which, yeah, and Daily, Ma- Daily Mail, I had forgotten for some reason. Daily Mail is not Murdoch owned, but it's part of that, like, you know, right wing uh, e- ecosystem. It it was it spins kind of surreal to to watch. Uh, basically, they you know they they got some early copies of the book and took you know quotes by people who were quoted in the book, uh, attributed them it attributed them to me, and then kind of elevated. Like for instance, there was one where um, one you know person for Sunrise um, said that um, one element of the Green New Deal rollout was a, you know, a cluster. Uh, and instead of quoting that person, they attribute to me and they, and they say that I re- report in the book that the entire Green New Deal was a, a giant cluster. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that, and, and that it, the whole, the whole thing was just wild to watch, you know, it's, it's cause you, you know, you're like that, no, the, none of these, none of these things are in, are in the book. I didn't, I didn't say these things at all. Um, there are some criticisms in the book, but they come from, you know, in earnest plays of like what, what lessons uh, can be learned. There, one of the other funny, and funny isn't the right word, but funny examples uh, was, you know, that I say that, you know, she became a, a like a pariah and, a, and uh, closed off to all these uh, donors without, set, closed off these big donors without, without adding the context that her decision to be closed off to these major donors um, is a good thing. And is a function of the squad's ability and the Bernie Sanders wing's ability to kind of raise so much, so many small do- dollars, and that that then appears to be a threat to the rest of the caucus. And they kind of flip that on its head into into you know whatever weird cynical kind of framing they, they put on top of it. So yeah, it's it, it, it's you know I've I've obviously seen that the kind of Murdoch empire do that for for years, but it was kind of surreal to like be in the middle of it and probably for you too having since you actually had read the book and you read these pieces and you're like hmm no that's not <laughs> that's not right that's not I mean yeah I think someone probably read it really quickly and just kind of ran with right. uh, the vibe yeah. <laughs> yeah they're like this this will click yeah let's just slap this up and then yeah. the next thing you know it's like just absolutely everywhere in conservative media it's like bizarre just utterly bizarre <laughs> Ryan Graham conservative media darling. Hey, if you liked that video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Breaking Points. If you want to see the rest of CounterPoints, go to breakingpoints.com to become a premium member and get the full uncut show every morning in your inbox and on Spotify. Help us build independent news and get the full show every morning at breakingpoints.com.